Open your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 6. And if you have a cell phone, if you would turn it off. <laughs> now nah, we all know how that works. We have all kinds of expressions for people who refuse to see things the way they are. We say, you know, wake up and smell the bacon. Are you serious? Open your eyes. Toughen up. Suck it up. Cupcake. You know, we have all kinds of ways of saying it. And Paul here has taken us to this place in, in this incredible letter. I always knew it was. And uh, I guess we started this back around October sometime. Didn't think we'd be here this long. Uh, but uh, there's so much, at least for me personally, that, that I've really gleaned out of this. But here's Paul is saying to the Ephesian Christians and to each of us that it's time to soldier up, that it's time to get real about, about what it means to be a Christian. He's taken us through all these glorious, these powerful truths. You know, you go back all the way to chapter one. He says that, you know, we're, we're known by God before the foundation of the world, that he's chosen us before the foundation of the world, that he's looked down inside of us and be, beyond all of, our, all of our sins and our failings and our, and, and our fallings and, and all of this, and even so, has loved us and called us to be his own, that he sent his son to pay the price for all of our sins, that we're redeemed in Jesus Christ that we're sealed by the spirit of truth. We were dead, but now we've been made alive in Christ. He says that all of this, the salvation that we have, is by grace, his grace alone, and through our faith, but by his grace. That we're created, we're called to Christ, we're saved now to do these good works that he has foreordained that we should walk in them that Jesus is our peace, that Jesus is the cornerstone of our lives, that he's building us, all of us together, into one glorious tabernacle, one glorious temple to the praise and the honor of his glory, that we're to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called, that we're to, that we're to strive to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I mean, really, you start to go through all these things that, that uh, we're new people, we're to walk in love, we're not to walk in immorality, we're not to, to use the foul language, we're not to, to crack the dirty jokes anymore, we're not to do any of those things, because we're called out of that. We don't just have this salvation as our ticket to get in that enables us to live any way we want to in the meantime, but we've been called out of that, and we're to live like we're called out of that. He says that we're to be filled with the Spirit constantly. He, he talks about what, it, what it's like to, to, to be the Spirit-filled wife, to be the Spirit-filled husband, to be um, the Spirit-filled child, the Spirit-filled parent, the Spirit-filled employee, the Spirit-filled employer. And now Paul says, see, I don't know what you do at the end of the book a lot of times. A lot of times we come to the end of the book and say, okay, we're done, and move on. But now he's, it's the, in many ways... As, as powerful as all those truths are, in many ways, what he's now done, he's brought us to this point, and now Paul's saying, now, let's step out onto the battlefield together. Because when we talk about spiritual warfare, I think that most of us have this weird idea. I know, I, I, I always have. I, mean, I saw The Exorcist in 1974, <laughs> and, I, and I never got you know, the pea soup and the spinning head out of, out of my head. I'm not much into booey wooey movies. I don't watch them. I watched a few when I was young, and that was enough for me. It, I just, it freaks me out, and, and I'm glad it does. Some of you watch them. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but I know some of you do, and it's like I cannot understand how you can reconcile who you are in Christ with that. There's no way, there's no reason to do it. And, and, and the thing is that, you know, Paul has not given us all of this to say these are great Bible truths. You can have good Bible studies with this stuff. Or you can memorize these scriptures. Of course, okay, we should memorize the Word of God. I think that's really important that believers memorize the Word of God. Frankly, most people don't memorize the Word of God as much as that we should. We say, oh, I'm not able. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We memorize all kinds of things. It's a question of priority. Here's Ephesus. You think about this. Here's Ephesus was the center of Diana worship, one of the most foul forms of worship in the entire world, the ancient world at that time. The Rome was, conquered the world. 
and, and Diana Worship, the, the headquarters, if you would, the center of Diana Worship was in Ephesus and it dominated the Roman Empire. And what happened in, em- in Ephesus through the, the gospel, the pouring out of the spirit and the gospel moving through Ephesus is that Diana Worship was neutralized ultimately in the Roman Empire. It began in Ephesus and it was neutralized throughout the, the Roman Empire or much of it, household by household over the years. And if you've read through Acts, you know that um, all the trouble, I'm not going to go into it all this morning, but all the problems that they had, that the believers had um, with the silversmiths who were making the idols and, and all of that. And you're probably familiar with the, the seven sons of Sceva. There was some pretty scavy stuff that was going on in Ephesus. I don't know where that's, if that's where it comes from. It worked for me just then. Um, <laughs> but Paul says, now let's step out onto the battlefield. And we're going we're gonna to take this in two parts. We're going to look at um, the Christian's warfare today, and we'll look at the, the Christian as a warrior next week. But let's read what it says here. He says now in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, finally, after all of this, so this is the climax, Finally, brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication. For the saints. I've ended in the middle of a run-on sentence, but uh, Paul will forgive me someday, I assume. (laughs) Most people see six weapons there, or six pieces of armor. There's seven, because prayer is often not put on the list for some reason, but prayer is a very important one, quite obviously. And we're not going to look at all that today, we're just going to look at a few verses. Just a couple of things I want to remind you of as you look at the, the passage again. Be strong in the Lord. The idea is be strengthened. Be strong in the Lord in the power of his might or in his mighty power, depending upon your translation. The the, the emphasis is not on you. The emphasis is not that you have to be strong. The idea is be strengthened in the power of his might. You see, the point is the battle that you and I have been called to, and sadly in this age, most Christians, probably not you, But most Christians don't want to think about the fact that we have been called to a battle, that we are in a battle. We think, oh, the battle is for certain other people. The battle is for missionaries. The battle is for evangelists. You know, we put these people up on on, on pedestals. The battle is for pastors, maybe some elders. But for me, I'm just going along to get along. Like, no, that's, we're, we're each called. We're each called to the battle. And we battle, we don't battle for victory. That's, that's a really important concept that I want us to understand here. We don't fight for victory. The reason this comes last, the reason this comes after everything else Paul has said, is that he wants us to understand that the fight is from victory. It's from our position of victory from the fact that we've been forgiven, from the fact that that we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, from all of that. On the basis of that, we have the victory. It's ours now to, and here's a key word that's repeated four times. The more it's repeated, the more you have to pay attention to it. And that is, we are to stand. It's a soldier's word, to stand. It means to take your stand. We're to stand, to take our stand. Four times he says it. Look, he says, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He says we're to um, 
we're, we're to stand, we're to withstand, and then we're to stand, to stand. Four times he says this, and I think it's six times he says against. We stand against, we stand against, we stand against these principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against. We are each called to take a stand and to, and to take that stand knowing that our power and the authority, if you will, comes from the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Most Christians don't believe this. And you may hear it, you might even write it down in, as a note, but in terms of how we live, there's the question, do we believe it as we pray? So many times I think we find ourselves even as we pray saying, oh God, begging God, as opposed to trusting the promises that he's already given us and praying from those promises, praying, praying you know, about that victory from those promises. What we see in this world is hardly the tip of the iceberg. We think that we, um, we think we see the battle raging all around us. We see a part of it. But the battle that's really happening is, is in the spirit. Contrary to what we think about ourselves, we're limited in our intellect. We think we're pretty smart people. But we're limited in our intellect. We're limited in our fleshly powers. We're blind to the other dimensions. So we come to this matter of the spirit world. Now some of you may have stumbled in here this morning. Maybe you're invited by somebody and you're thinking, what kind of a place is this? talking about the devil like, we don't come to this stuff very often we only preach about it or teach about it or study it when we get there so um, just as much as we believe that each one of us was born for a time such as this uh, you must have been brought in here today <laughs> to hear this so there are different perspectives that we have about about the devil there are three. There are three general perspectives. There might be some other bucket, but one, of course, is that we ignore him. Some of you already are thinking, oh, really? Satan, the devil, you know, the guy in the red PJs with the pitchfork, and, you know, he's got the, the goat horns and the goat hooves. It's like, no, that's the way he wants to be portrayed. You know, you see him on a hot sauce bottle. You know, no, that's, he wants to be portrayed that way. He wants to be portrayed that way so people will laugh at him and ignore him entirely. And some people just do ignore him entirely. Other Christians will, will act like his press agent sometimes. It's amazing how much people will talk about the devil. Sometimes it, it almost seems to me that people talk more about what the devil is doing in the world than what Jesus Christ has done in their own lives. Now, we have, to, we have to take him seriously. The scripture tells us that. I mean, in, you know, in Jude, verse 9, says that even Michael, the archangel, that there appears to only be one archangel, the archangel, even Michael, the archangel, didn't think to bring a railing accusation against the devil when he battled with him. He just said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. So, I mean, that, it's important for us to keep in balance or keep into perspective here, what, um, what God wants us to understand about the devil. But, and really, those are, the, those are the two common errors. You know, because Paul says, uh, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, I think, he says that uh, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Most Christians seem to be ignorant about Satan's devices. There, there are a few things that we're told not to be ignorant about, and th that's one of the things we're told not to be ignorant about. We're not to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. We're not to be ignorant about Israel. We're not to be ignorant uh, about the devil. And we're so ignorant about Israel. We're so ignorant about, uh, and I say ignorant, but sometimes I'm just being polite. Sometimes we're just plain stupid because we should have learned it, but we're not acting like we know it. Maybe sometimes we don't want to think about the devil because we're afraid that people will just think we're just strange. And we are strange. We're a peculiar people. That's what we're told. 
and some more than others, I know, but you know, I, we are. But we're to take this stuff seriously. And that's the third position, that we take this seriously. We treat him biblically. He's the God of this world. That's what we're told. You know, um, Paul says, 2 Corinthians in um, chapter 4, he says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. He's blinded their minds. And that's true. We know that. The God of this age. He's called the God of this age. When Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, the devil offers him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, I give you all the kingdoms of the world. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world in all of their glory. He said, I will give them all to you. You can all be yours if you will just bow down and worship me. And Jesus didn't say, oh no, this is my father's world. You know, we sing the song, we like the song, but Jesus didn't say that. Because if, if you read Revelation, Revelation chapter 5, the scrolls, the title deed to the earth, Adam forfeited that when he sinned. And so it is in the devil's hands for now. He was making an offer that he could make good on, so to speak. We don't like to see things that way. We don't want to believe things like that. All of this began with an attempted coup. We went through some of this back in, in the summer. We looked at uh, Daniel chapter 10. But he says in Isaiah 14, you know, how you've, been, how you've fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, for you've said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the throne of, on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most God, most high God. That's what he said. That's, that, that's his strategy. He said it right there. By the way, let's talk about that for a moment. Strategy, tactics. Those of you in business understand this. If you have a military background, you understand it. Strategy. We're going to take that valley. Tactics. Well, we'll use air cover. We're going to use infantry. Those, okay. So the strategy is that's the plan. We're going to take this. This is how. These are the individual ways in which we're going to do it. He uses a very interesting word here in verse 11, we're to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to, there's the word, stand. Not go into the fetal position. We're to stand. We're to take the stand against what? The wiles of the devil. Don't think wily coyote. <laughs> wiles. It's an old English word, but the idea is the, the wiles are the plans, the methods, right? the, the tactics, he has all kinds of tactics that he uses. We think we're so smart, we don't realize the things that he uses against us. And look, there are lots of books. Oh, there are tons of books. There are tons of books on, de on the devil, on fallen angels, on demons, it's become, again, it goes through the church in waves at different times. Uh, I've been a Christian long enough to see, I guess, about four or five waves. We're in a new wave of it right now, especially as we see what's happening with Russia. Everybody's talking about Gog, the prince of Rosh, and over the people of Magog, and Russia coming into Ukraine. Interesting. So everybody's talking about this. But there's so many books that have been written about angels and about demons and all of this. And, and you know, there is a good book. I mean, if you want to read uh, Billy Graham, I'm, I'm sure that there's other good books besides this. Bill, Billy Graham wrote a book years ago on angels, and it's been updated since then. It's a good book. This is the best book that you're going to find on the spirit world. I mean, why would we think that a man is going to come up with more information than this book has to offer? Why would we think that kind of thing? There's so much that we believe. Like, you know, Paul doesn't say, I'm kind of getting off track, here, but, uh, but like that's ever happened. But uh, <laughs> Paul doesn't say, now look, you're in Ephesus. These are the kind of demons that are operative in Ephesus. But if you're going to go outside of Ephesus over to Philippi, now there's another type of demon. There's spiritual mapping. And that, that's an idea that men came up with. Now, there are, and I, I can imagine where some of it comes from, and it's, and it's reasonable. Reasonable. That doesn't mean it's perfectly right. It's reasonable. And that is, 
The scripture tells, especially in Daniel chapter 10, we get the information there that there are that there are principalities and powers, as Paul refers to here, that are over geographic areas, right? Remember in Daniel uh, chapter 10, Daniel's been praying and fasting for 21 days. And then Gabriel shows up and he says, the moment you began praying, I was sent to you, but the prince of Persia held me up. He withstood me. It was a battle. Yeah, I battled with him, but I could not prevail until Michael, the archangel, showed up and then I, we won the battle, and I, I'm here to speak to you today. He says, and, and after I leave you, I will go and do, but think about this. After I leave you, I will go and do battle with the prince of Greece. Now, I find that fascinating, because from our standpoint, the prince of Greece, or Alexander, he, Alexander the Great is not the prince of Greece. The prince of Greece is an angelic host, okay? But Alexander the Great is the man we associate with the kingdom of Greece, the, 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 the empire of Greece, that comes 200 years later. So here he is, here's Gabriel telling Daniel about something that's going to happen 200 years after, after he lived. But from an angelic perspective, I guess, in the spirit, there was an understanding. You know, they, don't, they don't see time the same way that you and I do. And by the way, they, they don't know everything. Angels don't know everything. The devil himself does not know everything. He's not omniscient. He's a created being. And as powerful as he is, he's not all powerful. As, as much as he can be in so many different places, he can only be in one place at a time. Job chapter 1, chapter 2, twice, we hear the Lord say to Satan, where have you been? He says, I've been going to and fro throughout the earth. What's the point? He can only be in one place at a time. One place at a time. And I'm pretty sure that he's never had time for me. And I'm pretty sure he's never had time for any of you. I think he's probably using his time where the European Union is concerned, where, where at least in these days, he, he's spending his time in Washington, you know, where, where, where Biden is concerned, where, where Putin is concerned, where Xi Jinping are concerned. I have a feeling he'd put his efforts in these other places. But the Bible makes it clear that there's a multitude of these powerful angelic beings who operate in many different places. We'll get to some of that. Huh. So as much and as powerful as these all are, Let's keep a couple things in mind. First of all, Satan hates you. He hates all human beings. He hates all human beings. I just read his strategy, Isaiah chapter 14, is very clear. I will be like the most high. So why did he cause Adam to sin? Why did he entice that to happen back in Genesis chapter 3? Because Adam is created in the image and the likeness of God. And here's the, the chief cherub, apparently, that was his position, apparently, the chief cherub, Lucifer, who intended his, his battle plan, his strategy was to be like the Most High. And here's a man created in the image and likeness of God. So in, in his pride, because pride is always the root of it, pride was first found in the heart of Lucifer, in his pride, his plan was to destroy man so that man could not have dominion over all of God's creation as God intended. You and I forget who we are. We forget often who we really are. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him, David asks. Or the son of man, that you visit him. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you've crowned him with glory and honor. Yeah, we have been created slightly lower than the angels for now. One day, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, don't you know that you will judge angels? 
Think, have you ever really read that and just stopped and thought, what's that going to look like? One day we will judge angels? Yes, because you and I were created in the image and likeness of God. And, okay, so Satan hates all human beings because we were created in the image and likeness of God. He hates all human beings because God loves all human beings. He especially hates you and me because you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's nothing he can do. You've defected from his camp. He hates you. He can't steal your salvation, but he can ruin your testimony. And boy, he wants to do that, and I have seen it happen. As a pastor, I have seen it go down so many times. See, because there's no guarantee, because if you're in Jesus Christ and your sins are forgiven, there is no guarantee that you're not going to end up your life with, with a ruined testimony. There's no guarantee that you will not lose the calling that's on your life because you've chosen to dabble in areas that we never should have touched. And the devil knows those things. We should know them too because it's all here for us to know. But we choose not to believe those things. Sometimes it's because we believe some sort of pop theology that says, oh no, Jesus loves you so much. He treats us like this little toddler. No, he does not. He's equipped us, and now he says, now walk. Let's step out onto the battlefield. Take your stand. Get up out of the fetal position. You're going to take your stand on your feet with your armor, or you're going to take your stand on your knees in prayer. Either way, we are standing against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against hosts of wickedness in high places. Yeah, there are all kinds of of angels, all kinds of ranks of angels. Like we see Michael the archangel, Gabriel. And actually, you know, think about it, we don't know many names of these people, or they're not people, of these angels. <laughs> Michael, the archangel. What's an archangel? Not given a whole lot of information. I'm sure there's lots of books that'll describe them for you, but I don't know where they got their information. <laughs> Gabriel. Uh, I mean, it, it, the joke goes around that he's the, the, the angel of birth announcements. Like, I get that, but it, it, he has a messianic ministry, you'd say. He shows up to, to give information about the coming Messiah. There's only three that we know the names of. I mean, you'll read books. A lot of people, very interesting. By the way, I find books like the Book of Enoch, things like that. I just want to get it out there right now. I find those books interesting, but it's still considered pseudepigrapha. It means fake writing. We don't know whether it's true or not, but it's interesting. So sometimes we'll read about names of angels in those places. This is the authority. There's only three angelic names that we know. Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. He got himself in a whole lot of trouble. After that, we have ranks of angels. The cherubim. Cherubim. Uh, that, I mean, These are mighty, mighty warrior angels. God, God puts... Two cherubim, a cherub is the singular, cherubim is plural. He puts two cherubim with flaming swords to guard the way to the tree of life after, uh, after Adam and Eve have sinned and God has cast them out of the garden. Not to keep them from coming back, to keep, to keep the devil from having access to the tree of life so he can't use it to bring man into an eternal fallen state. That's why God did it, out of love. Cherubim, and we read about them again in Revelation. We, we read about those uh, around, the, the, called the four living creatures. They seem to be cherubim, the face of, face of a lion, face of um, an ox, the face of a man, face of an eagle. Uh, there's not a whole lot more I know. The seraphim, Isaiah chapter 6, seraphim. It means in, in Hebrew, burning ones. He said, I, I, saw, I saw seraphim flying over and around the throne. Six wings, with six they covered their faces, with six they covered their feet, and with six they flew. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Day and night they sang this. I mean, that's pretty wild to think about. There's Lucifer, Satan, the chief cherub, apparently. And then there are demons. And I can't get into much of this this morning, but it's an interesting area because we have a tendency to call fallen angels demons, and the Bible doesn't say that. And if you study the difference between them, I'm going to go fast, but so follow it. I hope you'll find it interesting. The difference between angels, whether they're holy angels or fallen angels, they're still angels. And the difference between angels and demons. Angels 
can appear like mighty spirit beings, 10 foot, five, whatever, the huge spirit beings, or they can appear like men. Apparently not women. I don't take that the wrong way, but I'm just, I'm just saying that to get it out there. Yes, I can be very un-PC sometimes. But, um, but, but, but they do. Demons, on the other hand, don't do that. You don't see demons. They're spirit beings. But they want to occupy some biology. They want to occupy a person of some sort. We have all kinds of ideas that people come up with about how that happens. I'm not sure where the books come up with some, but sometimes the Bible just tells us that it happens. Possession. Demons want to possess a biology. And read the Gospels, you know that a, a, a pig is as good as a man as far as a demon is concerned. The question is, where'd the demons come from? And that's why some people go back to, and some of you are going, oh, here he goes. I know, I know what he's going to do now. Not for long, I won't. But Genesis chapter 6, it brings up a very interesting question. What happened here? Where it says that angels intermarried with women, and the offspring were a strange, strange offspring called the fallen ones, the Nephilim. And that's the reason the flood was sent, because the whole earth was filled with that. So God destroys all of these Nephilim, weird, hybrid beings, for whom there was no hope of redemption. And he destroyed them. But it appears, you, you can't make doctrine out of this, it appears that the disembodied spirits of those are called the demons, and they're constantly looking for a host body. That appears to be what it is. You don't want to mess with any of it. Because here, you know, Satan's not bugging me. And he has fallen angels. He's got lots of them to use. And he has also got, apparently, all these demons, buck, private, rank, nothing demons, who have tons of power. And none of them can possess me, or you, if you're in Jesus Christ. Can they oppress? Can they harass? Oh, yeah. And the more you mess with the stupid stuff of this world, the more it's going to happen, because in that regard, we're just opening ourselves up to them. Isn't it interesting? I find it. Revelation chapter 20, the first three verses, it says that Satan was thrown down into the abyss. And an angel, actually an angel, threw him into the abyss and locked it. We're not told who the angel is. Does he have a name? I don't know. I don't know. Oscar? Norman? We're not told what his name is. Because his name isn't important is the point. It could be another, uh, again, a buck, private, rank, nothing, angel. But he has power when God gives him power. Look, all of this, you and I have been called to be warriors. We're not called to sit on the sideline and just point our finger and, and look, I, I end up in the same place we all do. It's a, it's a, it's a very nasty dangerous place where I want to point my finger at people I'd like to call buffoons. You say, how stupid. How could they do something like that? Point at Washington or Harrisburg or whatever the case may be. Like, we know something special. Like, we've got, if I was the president, this is what I would do. Like, okay. Um, <laughs> we are called to pray for our leaders. What we don't understand or we fail to understand. He said the devil is at work in those places, highly at work, because he has a plan for planet Earth. What does he have planned for us? Again, most of us, when we think of spiritual warfare, we've got imagery of all, all the, the entertainment, if you want to call it that, Hollywood. We have that imagery in our mind. I don't think that's his plan. I don't think, he, his plan is not to have your head spinning around, at least not that way. He has our head spinning in other ways. He has us confused. He doesn't plan for us to be spewing pea soup. He doesn't plan to, you know, just automate our children and have them running around doing so. No, no, no. The wiles of the devil. Look, he's called, by the way, Satan is a name he's been given. 
comes from a Hebrew verb, Satan. He's called Ha-Satan, the Satan, the Satan, which means accuse or to accuse. He's the accuser. That's what he is. That's who he is. He accuses us. When he stands before the throne of God, and he does, and he brings accusation against you or against me, he's right. He's not lying. Because he knows we've done it, he knows we've sinned, and he brings that up before the Father, and Jesus is our advocate. He doesn't say, yeah, Father, but you know, uh, uh, she placed her faith in me, so she's okay. No, no, no. You're not, you're not covered by his words. You're covered by his wounds, by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you. That's what has covered you. So he may accuse, but the accusation can no longer stick because you're redeemed in Jesus Christ. But he's the accuser of the brethren, he's called in Revelation chapter 12. The accuser of our brethren. And he doesn't just accuse you before the throne. He puts the thought in your mind to, put, to make that accusation against your other brother or your sister. It happens in marriages. It happens in families. It happens in businesses. It happens in church. It happens on staff. Not our staff. It happens with all people. That's what he does. And he makes those accusations so very believable. Because we live in our suspicions. We live in our suspicions of, a person did this. If I did that, it would have been because of this. So therefore, they must be, dot, 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 right? And be bad enough if that attitude just lived in our brain. That's never good enough because then he wants us to speak it out. What does James tell us? The tongue is lit on fire by hell itself. Right, come on, these are, these are his wiles. These are his tactics. This is what he does. If the Holy Spirit is the one who brings peace, right? Then what's the devil bringing? What do you think? Chaos. Warfare and chaos. If the Holy Spirit is the one who brings unity, what's the devil doing? Division. He, you know, over and over, if, if the Holy Spirit is the one who brings morality, then it's the devil who's bringing immorality. He's doing everything to the opposite. But what so many of us fail to recognize, Paul says that he, he says, even Satan himself masquerades masquerades get the word you know what masquerade means even satan himself masquerades as an angel of light i mean that, that that's that's a sunday by itself of so many stuff so much stuff that's going on in the church of jesus christ today that purports to be from god and is clearly from the devil even even the devil himself masquerades as an angel of light. When was the last time you read Joshua chapter 9? After, after the battle of Ai, where they're totally trounced because they didn't go in by prayer. They, they had such victory out in the wilderness and they cross the Jordan River and then God piles up the, the, the water. How high? I mean, 20 miles upstream, how high was that mountain of water? They cross over 3 million people on dry ground. They come in, just a t tremendous victory. Then they take Jericho. Man, the, the, the walls fall outward, which is that's not natural, right? And all this, and then someone says, look, there's a city called AI, it's just a few people, just send up a few guys. Okay, fine, let's, yeah, typical human thinking. A few guys, yeah, we, we, got, we, don't, we don't have time to bring everybody up there, just send a few guys, and they were, they were, they were struck down by them, right? They, they confessed their sins, of course, we find out, you know, Achan was a major part of the problem, that whole thing, chapter seven, chapter eight, and then, whew, that's over. Okay, God, we're ready, now what? And then here come the Gibeonites. Read the story again about the Gibeonites. They come in, they know, because the enemies know what God is doing through the, to the children of Israel. Just as the enemy knows what God wants to do through the church of Jesus Christ, it's the people in the church of Jesus Christ who don't realize it most of the time. And so the Gibeonites come in, they're thinking, look, they're going to come in, they're going to kill us all. 
let's try to make peace with them. Let's uh, negotiate something. So they come in with old sandals and, uh, and old clothing and, and moldy bread, and they come in. Like, oh, friends, yeah, we're from a far country, right? <laughs> And they, and they said, well, how do we know you're from a far country? Oh, just check out the moldy bread. Like, that's evidence. Right. And what did they do? They examined it. They used their eyes. They used their reasoning. They said, yeah, far country, they must be. They made a deal, and then they found out later on, no, they were from the other side of the mountain. The devil does the same with us. Think about this for a minute. There's a lot we could go over here, but... I want you to think about this. So what happens with Eve? Major question. Has God really said, did God really say that you're not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? Which clearly that wasn't. Oh, no, no, we can eat from anything in the garden. It's just the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're not to eat from it. We're not even to touch it. A whole other question. But anyhow... Nah, he, because in the day we eat it, we'll surely die. You shall not surely die. God just knows that when you eat from it, you'll be like him. And you'll know good from evil. She examined it. It was good to look at it. It would be good for food. And it would make her wise. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. She ate it, and you know what happened from there. Fast forward. We all know the story. You may not know much of the Bible, but you know this story. Matthew tells us, now pay attention to this. That's a weird thing to say, I feel like. Now listen. Think about this. Matthew tells us, and Luke tells us. Mark does not, neither does John. Jesus, after fasting 40 days in the wilderness, the devil comes to him, and he tempts him. We all know the story. How did they know? How does Matthew know that? He wasn't there. How does Luke know it? He wasn't there. Neither Mark nor John. So how do they know it? Because Jesus thought it important enough to tell them this is what the devil did. Because this is what the devil's going to do to you. So if he did it to Jesus, why would he not then do it to you and me? And he tempted him the same way he tempted Eve. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the categories where each one of us is always tempted. And yet the scripture tells us this. And I, I've got to close, but Paul says this. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not natural. You don't need a nuclear weapon to fight these wars. They're spiritual wars. You could take all the nukes in the world and you'd never win a spiritual battle. But that's where most of us are spending our time. We're spending our time with our, with our verbal arguments. We're spending our time with our money. We're spending our time in all these areas that are carnal. They're not spiritual to battle. And that will, as we examine the armor next week, we need to be, first of all, having the belt of truth. All of our weapons tied into truth. Not into rumors, not into suspicions, not into accusations, not into theories, not into books we picked up somewhere or some CD we listened to or any of that stuff, but in the truth from the Bible itself. And all of the armor, all of the armor up through the shield of faith all of that in the helmet of salvation are all defensive. And they're all worn on the front side. There's nothing to cover your butt because we're not supposed to be fleeing. We are to face the issue. We're to face the issue. We're to face the enemy. We're to face the conflict. The two weapons that we have, everything else is armor. Two weapons. One is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's not your Bible. You don't beat the devil with the Bible. He knows it better than you do. It's the word of God. That's why we have to be in the word of God so that we know to use the truth that God has already sown into our hearts, that we speak those things in prayer. And the other offensive weapon, prayer itself. 
there's a battle raging all around us. The enemy is mighty. He really is. But the fact is that the war has already been won. And, and as, as simplistic as that ought to be, I need to remind myself of that over and over and over. Please, read these verses every day in your quiet time. Every day, read them. Pray about them. Write down what God is teaching you through this. And we'll come back and we'll look at this.